that gradient, and you repeat. You do this over and over again until you, a certain number of iterations or until you've converged. Uh, and you know, this requires a lot of passes over the data. And even if you're not doing gradient descent, even if you're training a tree or a naive Bayes classifier or whatever else, this is a pretty common access pattern. That you look over your data, you update your model, and you, you know, iterate back and forth. Uh, and the point is that, you know, let's say I have a pretty large data set, 200 gigabytes, and I want to train an SVM on it. It actually doesn't take that long. It only takes a few minutes to do that using, you know, in a distributed setting, for instance, using MLM. So you might think, all right, well, this isn't such a big deal. But the problem is that, you know, you're not just training one model. Again, you're training many, many models. So, right, you're not just necessarily even using an SVM, but you might be looking at logistic regression or decision trees or random forests or deep learning, whatever, whatever you'd like. Uh, and, you know, each of these algorithms have their own hyperparameters. And then beyond that, there's, of course, different features that you want to use. Given your raw data, are you going to, you know, if you have text, you can use n-grams or, uh, you know, bag of words, n-grams, TF-IDF. If you, if you have images, what sort of transformations you're going to do with them and so on. So this space gets pretty big pretty fast. In this work to start, to try to make some initial progress, we're focusing on just the algorithm component of things. Uh, so going back to this standard pipeline, the problem that I'm going to be presenting results on today is that of automa automated model search. So basically, we're assuming that we have fixed features. How do we automate the process of selecting a model? And you know, with that in mind, one, the natural thing to do, one approach, is grid search. It's what pretty much you know, typically people do in practice. It's a pretty simple thing to do, and the idea is you kind of just try everything. So basically, here's an example on the right. Imagine I have a two-dimensional hyperparameter space of learning rate and regularization. I want to grid up the space in some way and basically try every point on that grid. So here's the best answer that you know, I don't know, but I'm trying to find. And I basically, each of these dots corresponds to a trained model, and I train all of them one at a time. And you know, hopefully, eventually, one of my grid points will be pretty good. Uh, you know, the problem here, obviously, is that it's expensive, right? It's, a, it's expensive to compute on all these models, uh, to train all these models. Models, the hyperparameter space can get very large. That being said, it really is what people typically do in practice. So what I'd like to explain to you today about is, uh, you know, in MLOP, our strategy of kind of improving upon naive grid search in a distributed setting. So what we think is a better approach is something based on three things. One is better resource allocation. And the idea here is that if you're in a distributed setting, uh, and actually, even if you're not in a distributed setting, it makes a lot of sense to instead of train one model at a time, do it sequentially to train multiple models at the same time. Uh, second, you know, you can frame this problem of model search as an instance of a multi-arm bandit problem. Or more simply, you can just stop early on for algorithms that aren't, or on models that aren't looking very good. So basically what I'm showing here in this picture is that the, the shaded out circles are models that we started to train, but then we gave up on early because they didn't look so great. And the third one is improved search. So grid search is one way to go, but there are other ways to try to solve the search problem. And you know, there's been recent work on that that shows that grid search isn't necessarily the best way to go. So I'd like to briefly talk about each of these in more detail and then show results uh, of us combining all of these optimizations together to get improved results. All right, so first, better resource allocation or utilization. The intuition here is that you know, if you want to do a model update, let's say gradient descent, that typically involves you know, two to four flops per double, basically for you know, do multiplies and doing adds. But the insight here is that memory is a lot slower than processing. So we can do 25 flops for the cost of reading a single double, but it only takes two to four flops to actually compute a model update. Right? So this equates to six to eight model updates per double, assuming that our models all fit in cache. So this leads to the obvious conclusion that maybe, you know, let's try to train multiple models simultaneously. So we tried to do this in Spark, uh, and our first results were somewhat mixed. What you're seeing here on the right in this table is each row is batch size, so training one model up to 10 models in parallel, or you know, on each iteration, and each column is the dimension of the features. So basically, when we train 10 models at a time and we have small models of, uh, you know, with 100 features, we do pretty well. We get a five, over a 5x speed up. But the issue here is that you know, once you get to feature spaces of 10,000 dimensions, which isn't really that large for big data settings, we kind of lose all of that speed up. We're down to 1.1x, which is kind of you know, nothing. Uh, but we realized that you know, these initial experiments are kind of naive, and they're, they're updating each model on its own in, you know, in some for loop. What you could do instead is you know, appeal to 20, 30 years of numerical linear algebra and try to call into very fast, low-level linear algebra libraries. So use things like LAPAC rewrite your updates all, all together for the batch in terms of matrix matrix multiplies. And doing that really helps you. So basically, these are the same experiments, but now writing the updates as matrix matrix multiplies and using LAPAC, and basically we still get over a 5x speed up when using large feature spaces. So that's, you know, that's pretty nice. Um, the second 
optimization is these, these, are these algorithmic speed ups I was talking about. Uh, and the idea here is that, you know, remember back in this picture, we have this grid. This is a, you know, toy two dimensional hyperparameter space. Each of these red dots corresponds to a fully trained model. And the insight here is that sometimes models look really bad really quickly. So this plot on the bottom is showing here is on the x axis the number of epochs and the number of passes over the data we've made to train. And the, the y axis is our uh, accuracy, or I guess error on holdout data set. So basically lower is better. And basically, assuming that we've already run the model corresponding to that red line, we know after a few, a few epochs that that green line isn't going to do very well. So, you know, if it looks bad, let's just give up early and stop. And don't waste all those resources computing the end result of a model that you don't want to use anyway. And it turns out that, you know, you can very naturally frame this in the, in the machine learning, in, in the machine learning setting of multi-arm bandits. Uh, and the work that I'm going to talk about today, we're using a very naive approach, but it's, it's an interesting thing that we're working on to, you know, come up with smarter multi-arm bandit problems to more efficiently perform this, this pruning, if you will. Um, and basically we, what I'm showing here are results using a pretty naive multi-arm bandit algorithm where we're comparing results on five data sets. The bars on the left correspond to training each model or each arm to completion. The, the bars on the right are training those corresponding models but stopping early on models that don't look very good. And we see across these five data sets that we're getting roughly a 5x speed up. And you know, the results aren't shown, but the accuracy, the holdout accuracy is roughly the same across them. So pretty much for little to no loss in accuracy, we, we get the speed up. All right, so finally, improved search. Uh, so you know, th this problem of searching through this hyperparameter space can be interpreted as a you know, derivative-free optimization. We want to search through some space, but we don't have access to the underlying function that we're trying to optimize. But there has been a lot of work on trying, trying to solve this sort of problem. Random search and gr grid search being the most obvious. Random search is a, you know, a very close relative to grid search. But there's also methods, you know, classic derivative free optimization where you're trying to approximate derivatives or pro approximating, you know, some sort of uh, uh, lines or, yeah. So they're approximating derivatives. Uh, there's been new Bayesian methods that people have proposed to solve this sort of problem. And basically there's a lot of stuff out there. So we just did an empirical study to see which one worked best on a handful of data sets. So the results are as follows. What, what you're seeing, I'm an, eventually I'm going to just fill the screen with plots that look like this. So I figured I'd explain one of them first. The idea here is that on the x, each of these bars correspond to uh, training a certain number of models. I think it goes 16, 81, 256, and so on. Uh, and the y-axis is the validation error. So lower is better. You'd expect the numbers to decrease as you explore more and more, uh, more, and more models. Uh, and as you go horizontal, you're gonna, we're showing results for a single data set, but different methods. So basically for this one method, we see that grid search does quite badly, uh, but that random search and TPE and SMAC, two of the more recent Bayesian methods, perform quite well. And then if you, you know, look at other data sets, the trend is sort of similar. Uh, grid search really is not very good. For these, uh, you know, for these problems, random search does quite well, and SMAC and TPE also do well. Slightly better, actually, than random. So with these three optimizations in mind, let's put it all together and, you know, and see how we can do. And so we're calling this the first version of the, the ML-based optimizer. Uh, these are experiments on you know, a modest-sized data set, 30 gigabytes. Uh, we're looking at two different model families with five hyperparameters. Uh, our baseline is grid search. That's where sequential grid search is what we're comparing against. And then we try our, you know, our combined approach of including batching, this bandit-based approach, and either random, random search or TPE, because they were the ones that performed best in our small-scale experiments. And basically what we're seeing here on the left, or on, on the uh, x-axis is time spent. Uh, on the y-axis is validation error. So again, lower and to the left is better. And the punchline is that you know, we get roughly a 20x speed up compared to grid search on this problem. So basically something you can do over lunch versus something that would take you almost the whole day. Uh, we then, you know, tried to scale this up just to see if it worked, and, you know, in short, it does. Uh, so this is a data set that's an order of magnitude bigger. It's over a terabyte. It's similar data set, just much larger. Uh, you know, using a, using a distributed cluster with 128 nodes, we, we do thousands of passes over the data. And basically, we can get a, a good answer after 11 hours. Oops, sorry. Yeah, we get a good, good answer after 11 hours. This is using our optimized approach. Doing this with naive grid search is sort of infeasible, just you know, given, given the scaling results we saw in the past. OK, so that's a, a rough overview of what we've been doing so far with MLOpt. And of course, we focused on this automated model selection problem. What we really want to do is focus moving forward on you know, auto-tuning multiple components of this pipeline. It's an active area of research. We're not, you know, we're not there yet, but hopefully 
uh, next year I could come back and hopefully tell good, good stories about that. Um, and just to give a little bit more insight of that, this is the sort of, you know, this is an example of the sort of real world pipeline that we want to tune. I'm not going to really give much details about it other than just saying, you know, there's a lot of hyperparameters to tune. So there is some additional work involved to actually get some, this is a, this is an image classification pipeline. There's a lot of work involved to actually go beyond just training, you know, auto-tuning a simple, single model versus the entire pipeline. Some other future work that naturally I think comes out of this sort of work, one is that of ensembling. So in this, in this process, we're training a bunch of different models. Sure, we're going to find one probably that's the best, but there's probably going to be many models, especially if we're using different model families that all perform well. Somehow combining results from all of them should probably do better than any one on its own. So it seems natural to, you know, incorporate that moving forward. Uh, the second is leverage sampling, right? There, it's not necessarily clear that you need to use all of your data to train every one of your models while doing the search. So trying to figure out how to, you know, and you know, you can naively just downsample everything, but then you don't really know what you're doing. So in a more principled way, using sampling to speed up the search is a very natural thing to do. Uh, third, better parallelism for smaller data sets. So when data is very big, you want to train in a distributed fashion. But if your data can fit on a single node, you can still use a cluster, but in a different way by training everything locally with different hyperparameters, for instance. So figuring out when to use which is a, or having a system that knows when to use which mode of search is a, is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and finally, uh, as you're training more and more models and more and more hyperparameters, you run into a risk of, you know, you, you have to account for multiple hypotheses, multiple hypothesis testing issues. So that's something that, you know, we need to look at moving forward. Okay, so with that, uh, I will conclude. We talked about ML base today and the different components, uh, and I'd be happy to take questions or maybe we can do it after during the coffee break. Okay, cool. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, you mean for ML up? Yeah. No, so we yeah the, we don't actually have the full we we focused on the that predicting or the the predict clause in that query. We don't actually have the actual API yet. But the point is, once that's done, the the rest of the SQL query is just SQL, so it should be hard to to bake in. How do you decide on? Oh yeah, so so yeah, so what we're doing right now, I would say, is is a very simplistic approach. Basically, what we're doing right now is we're saying we're running for a certain number of iterations each of the models. After running that many iterations, we compare each model to the best model we've seen so far, and everything that's close enough to the best model, we keep exploring. Everything else, we throw out. A smarter thing to do would be. You know, rather than just having, doing that in a sort of a repeated way. Keep pruning a subset of the things that are performing really well and be, be more conservative. And yeah, so there's different ways to do it. We're doing the simplest thing we can do right now. We do run the risk of false positives. But the, the idea of framing this as a bandit problem is that you can show that you get minimal regret. Or, you know, you, you can get theoretically the low, you know, lower bounds on the regret that you could possibly get by doing this thing in a clever way. What we're doing is not the most clever way to do it. It still works, but there's definitely room for improvement. Do you still feel that you'll have a predictive query interface to this, or is it the case that the things that you're producing with this are so complicated that it's not really Sorry, I, do, we, do I still think we're going to have a predictive query interface or or what? Do I think that we will eventually actually have a pack query for this, you're saying? Yeah, is that still your goal? Yeah, I mean, that is the goal. I think the one other thing that, so you, we have to get these results. We also have to, I think one other, I think there needs to be some way to report to the user, uh, you know, the quality of the best model that we found for them. So that they, basically, you don't want to, you know, even if we find the best model, but it's, you know, wrong 20% of the time, we need to make sure the user understands that when using that for downstream tasks. And that's, you know, that's not something we've looked at yet, but that's, you don't want to blindly give predictions to anybody and have them just trust that they work. So there is some work there, but yeah, I mean, I think there's no reason that this can be useful, yeah. Well, that's a question. Um, two questions if I could. One is, oh. <laughs> uh, one is, are you doing anything with the uh, algorithm specific things? Like with the decision tree, you can search other parameters before uh, going really deep with the tree. You know, so you can be much more computational quicker. Um, with, you don't know certain things about certain algorithms. 
Sure. So we're not doing. I mean, the only one thing we are doing is that the, we're doing things in sort of an iterative way. We're not. Right, we're not. The fact that we can even stop early means that we are making some assumptions about the access pattern of the algorithm, and that it's iterative rather than just solving. You know, completely getting the answer it wants to completion. So in that sense, we're we are already making an assumption about the algorithms that we're training. But yeah, we're beyond beyond that assumption. We're completely. Uh, we're being general, and I imagine you could do better if you focused on a particular set of a particular type of algorithm and how it was trained and, and tailored your search that way. But we're not doing that yet. Sure. I mean, I, I don't think that, that given all the information that we're collecting as part of this process, that's really, I mean, that's, a lot of that is just like a, a UI issue, but a very important one, I agree. So we're not doing that yet, but there's no reason we couldn't. We're collecting all the information in order to make that happen. Thanks.